Cool. Nice to meet you guys. I'm Sam. Uh, I'm an investment engineer with A16Z Crypto. These guys are sleepers as well. They work with A16Z Crypto as well. <laughs> Um, so I'm I'm presenting on Lasso and Jolt today. This will be a fairly similar talk to the, the ZK Summit talk, which is newly online. Um, what will make it different is please ask questions and then we can go anywhere we want with it. And uh, we can go deeper on various stuff. I can pull up code and I can show you tables and we can walk through the code if that's interesting. But any direction you want to go, I'm sure other people want to go that direction too. So please uh, butt in and let me know. Do my rough skills. Okay. Um, so first, some background. Um, what are these papers? Um, Lasso was written by Srinath Seti, Justin Thaler, and Riyad Wabi. Provides a faster lookup argument prover than the existing constructions. Uh, it's capable of proving lookups into massive tables, think on the order of two to the 128 entries. And you pay costs roughly proportional to the number of lookups rather than the table size. Uh, Jolt's built on top of Lasso. It applies um, Lasso to uh, the an entire instruction set. Think Risk Five or Wasm or the EVM, um, and it has a faster prover with more accessible DevX and easier auditability than the other approaches. Um, in, in terms of background, is uh, do most people here have some zk background? Does, does a multilinear extension make sense to everybody? Okay, we are going to do that background, but. If I'm going too slow or too fast, let me know. I think you might be good to it. Okay, cool. Um, in terms of agenda, we're going to talk about lookups. What are they? Why we care? We're going to do a high level on sort of the lineage of where Lasso and Jolt come from. We're going to talk about multilinear extensions for a bit. Um, and then we're going to build a full single instruction Jolt VM and show you what that uh, highly unstable developer experience looks like. Um, first, what is a lookup? Um, so this is a bitwise instruction. This is bitwise or. This is where you take two integers, you represent them in terms of their bits, and you operate over each pair of bits sequentially. Um, these are very efficient within silicon, um, but very expensive within a snark because you have to decompose these elements into their bit representation, which can be 64 or even 256 bits, operate over each uh, set, and then recompose them. Um, so what can we do instead? Um, there is an idea known as a lookup, where you take all permutations over the operands. Um, here, we're taking two two-bit operands, so all permutations, two to the four rows. Um, then we have these this two to the four row size table. We can pre-compute pre this, we can commit to it, and then we can do a cheap um, operation in a snark known as a lookup, where you just create an evaluation proof that this operation exists somewhere within this table. So this is pretty reasonable for two-bit operands, but a two-bit operand table is pretty useless. Uh, realistically, you'd want each of those parameters to, for a VM to be 64 bits or even 256 bits, which means you end up with a table of size two to the 128 rows, which is entirely impractical to pre-compute, much less to commit to or create evaluation proofs over. Um, so in practice, instead, what we often do um, is a chunking operation. So this is a 32-bit operand. We take our uh, integers, we represent them as bit vectors again. But then rather than splitting them up into individual bits, we're going to split them up into four-bit chunks. Oh, wow. I, the other version of this has this accelerated, but we're going to wait for all of these to load in. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so, you know, two to the four, or there's, there's eight bits of operands here. So we have two to the eight rows. That means that's a reasonably sized lookup table. Um, and so it's some hybrid of the two. Um, and still, these operations are very cheap. We can do each of these lookups into an eight bit lookup table. Is it 12 bits? Uh, the, the operand size is eight bits. So oh, oh, okay. like this is the output of the operation. Those are the, the inputs. So yeah. two to the eight rows. Um, okay. And that's much more reasonable to compute. Um, so this brings us to an interesting question. Um, you can think of, imagine we have this two to the 128 size table. We aren't going to use many of those rows, even across all of the computer programs in the world. Um, and so you can sort of analogize, and, and most of these lookup arguments, you pay costs roughly proportional to the size of the table itself. 
You can analogize this to building a very large library, putting in all the shelves, filling it with books, getting on a ladder to collect two of the books out of it and then burning the library to the ground. It's pretty wasteful. Um, and so you wonder if there, there might be a better way. Um, so this brings us to the high level idea behind Lasso. The key idea of Lasso comes from a paper called Spartan by Serena Seti. Um, in 2020, Spartan presented this idea of the Spark uh, Spark commitment scheme, which is a uh, sparse polynomial commitment scheme. That is one where it can efficiently commit to multilinear polynomials where the majority of evaluations are zero. In other words, a sparse multilinear polynomial. Um, Spartan presented this idea in the context of R1CS circuit sat. Um, where if you've ever done R1CS, you know that the majority of those uh, terms and those matrices are zero. And so it's wasteful to have to pay costs to commit to all of them. Um, so where Spark applied this to uh, uh, R1CS commitments, instead, we're gonna apply this to sparse lookups to hopefully have a similar reduction in cost profile. Um, this idea is known as surge um, and it allows us to create uh, like sparse opening proofs to lookups. Um, and then lasso is a thin wrapper around this. That is sort of our back end for Jolt. Uh, so the result of all of this is lasso. Lasso is a lookup argument where you pay costs roughly proportional to the number of lookups rather than the size of the table you're looking into. Um, this is so efficient that rather than use lookups as some niche tool of VM design, we believe that all VM uh, instructions can be looked up directly. Um, they have exactly the same cost profile and complexity. Um, so you can construct these two to the 128 size tables freely and you let Lasso do the heavy lifting. Um, so here we show a 64-bit bitwise AND uh, proof. So this is two 64-bit operands doing bitwise AND. Um, and we can do roughly a million, uh, a proof of roughly a million of these instructions in around 16 seconds. Um, and the, the point here is that all 64-bit uh, operand, two 64-bit operand instructions uh, can be done with exactly the same efficiency and complexity. So there's two specific important takeaways here. First, it's very fast. Um, so this compares to the Halo 2, KZG, and IPA backends. Halo 2 is the most common usage of lookups in roughly production today. There's not that many production examples of ZK, but the one that most people are building on top of. And this is the most apples to apples comparison we can do. Um, and Lasso is the line on the bottom, or roughly 10 to 40 times faster on sort of the most direct, direct comparison we can do. But it really shines in sort of uh, indirect comparisons. Uh, the second takeaway is that it's very simple. Um, so Jolt VMs are highly modular and highly comprehensible. Um, what I'm going to hope to prove to you today um, is that these uh, these VM this is the cleanest and simplest way to build a VM. This is roughly the entirety of what you need to build a Jolt VM. Um, so later we'll preview actually building one of these out, but this is what I'm going to try to prove out. Yeah. Um, what lookup argument is Halo two using? It's just some uh, um, they have their own actually. The uh, the it's not not even the one in the Halo Two paper. Um, but I don't know the specifics of what it's called. But it's like a swappable scheme. Is that why? Oh, commitment or or lookup argument? Uh, it's because are those the same lookup arguments just instantiated? Yeah, the the commitment the scheme is either the the IPA or KZG backend commitment scheme, uh, but you can apply that to their lookup argument. Okay, so and that, just... that determines the properties, roughly speaking, of the lookup argument. Okay, so it's like the same lookup argument, just with different... Uh... Different commitment scheme, yeah. Um, and in practice, um, most people use the, the KZG backend, which is the one that's slightly faster. Um, okay, so first a brief detour on multilinear extensions. Um, so Many of you might be more familiar with the univariate low degree extension. This is used thoroughly throughout Flonk and other things. Um, this is where you take a series of points um, and you encode them along a polynomial by interpolation. Um, so if your points were 8, 6, 7, 5, 3, 0, 9, um, at your polynomial's zeroth point, you're going to evaluate to 8, first point to 6, et cetera. So you interpolate this line. This allows us to commit to it. Um, 
Multilinear extensions are going to do the same thing except over bit vectors. So all of the parameters are only going to be defined on the domain zero and one. Um, and so for uh, if, if you want to define up to uh, like seven, you're going to have a, a three bits of parameters on it. So where before we had this uh, 8675309 encoded over the univariate domain, we are going to do the same over the multivariate domain by just encoding the bit vector that represents zero, then the bit vector that represents one, et cetera. And you probably heard this term, the Boolean hypercube. In this case, we have just the Boolean cube. Um, okay, so. At your basis, sorry, going yeah. back to that. Um, could you have fit like one more evaluation? Yes. I'm wondering if we yeah. have it right here, or we could have done that today. Yeah, we can do up to F to the eight here. Yeah, good, good call out. Um, so I wish that I could tell you this was the Boolean hypercube, and if you look deep into it, you'd find the evaluations you seek. But really, this is this is the Boolean hypercube. It's just uh, integer indexes sequentially, rather than being represented as a single integer. You have bit vectors of uh, size dependent on the maximum in, uh, index you'd like to support. Uh, and we do this for to be able to support uh, multivariate polynomials for usage with the sum check protocol. Um, okay, and then we're going to talk about multilinear extensions briefly. Um, so I'm going to introduce the EQ instruction here. The EQ instruction is going to take two integer operands. It's going to return zero if they're unequal and one if they're equal. Um, so in the case of three one, we're going to get zero. In the case of two two, we're going to get one. Um, in our case, we're going to operate over um, uh, like the, the multivariate Boolean domain or bit vector domain. And so in our case, we want to represent 0, 1, 2, 3. So we can do that with two bits. Um, and so each of these uh, EQ instructions is going to take four bits of inputs, two bits for the first operand, two bits for the second operand. Um, the multilinear extension of that operation is denoted with this twiddle here. We're going to call that EQ twiddle. Um, and the multilinear extension is defined as the function which evaluates to the same thing as the operation over the entirety of the domain on which the operation is defined. So in our case, that's all uh, bit vectors of length two. And so that's a zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. <clears throat> um, the general uh, equation for the multilinear extension of EQ for B bits is this function here. If we expand that for B bits or for B equals two, we end up with this. And if you plug in our original um, values, you'll you'll find that these evaluate to the same thing over the entirety of that length two Boolean hypercube. Um, and more generally, like this, this uh, multilinear extension exists for most operations uh, we'll need to do. Oh, and the, the other interesting thing here is where the EQ operation was defined only over the Boolean domain, the multilinear extension of EQ is actually defined over a much larger domain of all uh, length B uh, field element vectors and also returns a different field element. Okay, so now we're going to do a preview of the Jolt developer experience. So we're very much working on this at the moment. Lasso is complete. Lasso allows you to do a single instruction um, do a lot of lookups over a single instruction. That's not particularly useful. Jolt will allow you to define a full VM of you know 50 or so instructions, um, and we'll prove all the all of it for you. Uh, this is Jolt is not done. Jolt is being worked on in this branch here. Um, so this is very much a preview today, but hopefully we'll be out in the near future. Um, so if you were to build an implementation of Lasso and build an implementation of Jolt on top of it. You spend a lot of very late nights with the paper, uh, which is about 60 pages of math. And then the Jolt paper is another 60 pages of math on top of that. You'd eventually binary search your way down to this, which is figure five um, of the surge polynomial IOP. Uh, the good news is that if you build on top of us, you only have to understand this green box here. Um, and so we're gonna unpack that a little bit. Um, so there's two Rust traits that you'll have to implement. Is this big enough for people to see? Okay. 
Uh, there's two Rust traits you'll have to implement. To implement a Jolt instruction, you'll implement one Jolt instruction per VM instruction. Um, so the first Jolt instruction has four functions. The first two combined lookups in G poly degree correspond to this bit here. Uh, the subtables function corresponds to these T sub I um, tables. Um, and for each of them, you'll have to define this lasso subtable trait. And the subtables function just returns a vector of those subtables. This is the trait object thing I was telling you about. Mm -hmm. um, and finally, two indices describe some indexing stuff down here. Well, we're going to go into all of these in detail. I'm just giving a roadmap. Uh, for the subtable, uh, there's only two functions on it. There's materialize which is just the evaluation over the M size Boolean hypercube. Um, and then evaluate MLE, which is that multilinear extension function we talked about earlier. Wait, so by size, do you mean dimension or do you mean something slightly? Um, so M here. Yeah, so M, M is a, we'll get to it in a second. Okay. Um, okay. So the, the Jolt VM we're going to build is going to be a one instruction VM. So not particularly useful, but the idea is generalized. You can build more instructions. Uh, for the 8-bit EQ instruction, that is the EQ instruction where each parameter is 8 bits. Um, so again, with 3.3, 3, we're going to map that to a, a length 8-bit vector. Each of these bits individually is equal. We're going to get 1, 8, 4. These bits are unequal, so we're going to get 0. Um, and so the, the mental model that you want to build here is of this, this lookup table. This is the lookup table of all of the permutations of the operands. So this is uh, a table that has EQ of uh, zero represented as a, as a length 16-bit vector or 16 zeros, then EQ of, uh, of one represented as a bit vector of, of 16 bits, all the way up to... Um, Two to the sixteen, two to the sixteen minus one represented as a bit vector at the bottom, and so that whole thing would be of length uh, two to the sixteen. That's the we're going to call that the big table, and we're going to call that big table size, the number of rows. We're going to call that n in our case, two to the sixteen, two to the uh, number of operands. Um, but I told you earlier that uh, if we did this with a 64-bit operands, this table, big N, would be size 2 to the 128, which is entirely impractical, and we can't work with it. So instead, we're going to do a collation thing here. We're going to make four, what we're going to call subtables, these EQ prime tables. These are going to be two-bit tables. Remember again that for 8-bit operands, this doesn't actually matter. You don't have to do this. It's just imagine we had 64 bits. I didn't want to put 64 bits on the screen. So we're going to make these two-bit EQ subtables, and we're going to pairwise copy our terms in. Um, and then note that uh, the so the EQ big table, depending on the parameters, is going to return zero or one, depending on whether the bits are equal or unequal. The EQ subtables are also going to return zero or one. If any single one of them is unequal, it's going to return a zero. We're going to multiply that through, and we're going to get the same evaluation as the big table. So we just take the product over all the subtable evaluations, and you end up combining them. So, so not, not every instruction can be decomposed in this way. So... Um, we can get into some examples later, but the point of the Jolt paper is to prove that uh, there is a decomposition property for all of these tables. This is known as spark-only structure, or SOS. And it's uh, not rigorously defined what you can and cannot define in this, but Jolt shows you can do it for the entire RISC-V instruction set. Um, okay, so this allows us to define another parameter. This is C. This is the number of subtables that we used. In our case, it's four. And now we have this idea of like the, the subtable. And so before where we had a, a, a a big table of size two to the sixteen. Now we only have four bit of four bits of operands. That means we have this subtable of size two to the four. This is that EQ prime table. This allows us to define another parameter called M. This is our subtable size. This has so this subtable has M rows or N to the one over C rows. In our case, it's two to the four. Yeah. Now we can go back to the green box. We understand all the all the things more uh, concretely. Um, so n is our sub or our big table size, in our case two to the sixteen. 
Um, we know that C equals four. Um, we're also going to define this parameter called K. This is the number of subtables unique subtable types you need to define a big table row. In our case, we only needed that EQ prime subtable. So K is one that makes alpha equal to C. Um, so C was equal to four because we have four EQ subtables. Um, this also allows us to define the, the size of those subtables, which was M, N to the one over C, in our case, two to the four. Um, and finally, we can define the collation function G. Uh, this is how we combine our subtables to make a big table row. In our case, we just took a product of all of them, right? Because if any of them are zero, it's going to be unequal. If all of them are individually equal, we're going to get a one. <clears throat> okay, so that's the entirety of the green box. Yeah. Just taking a step back, so the protocol in which that green box is attached, what was the goal of that protocol? Uh, so this is the surge. Man. Okay. Uh, so this is the surge polynomial IOP. So this is just the um, this is like the 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 core of Lasso. Lasso doesn't do much on top of this. Do you actually have the equation in here? Um, this this basically proves that all of the all of the desired lookups exist within this big table via a series of decompositions. Okay. Um, uh, it is actually the whole thing. So this, uh, okay, so you see, can you see this? I don't know if this yeah. is too small. I wasn't, wasn't intending to describe this. Um, what Surge does is it, uh, there's this sparse matrix M um, that is all of the lookups that you'd like to do for every operation uh, within a trace. So like you, you know, you might want to look up, you know, you, you have uh, 500 different uh, combinations of and lookups for 64 bits of lookups. Um, and we basically do this uh, sum check to prove that um, like all of those lookups exist within the table. And so then this protocol goes about building that out um, through a few different steps. And so the, the first step here, um, the, the first step here we'll do sort of the collation function that says like. Uh, well, uh, I guess is it like um, the prover commits to values for ahead of time and then they try to prove to you that it satisfies some that relation on the bottom? Or yeah, that... exactly. So you, you commit to your full trace of all the lookups that'll oh. contain like. Um, you know, all of your AND lookups and all of the operations. And Jolt, that will also include what the operation types are, right? You might have an AND and an EQ and a less than all within the same thing. Um, and then you try to prove that like this entire trace of, of lookups is valid. Okay. The entire trace of instructions is valid. So you have to do one of these per instruction type? Um, so within Jolt, which we're not going to go into today, this is like auto-collated for you. Mm -hmm. um, you have to build one of these instructions for instruction type, um, but this this whole surge step happens across fifty different instructions simultaneously within a single sum check. Oh, do you like bake the offload into the table, or do you do different arguments for every instruction? You commit to uh, so the the table becomes a lot more complicated as a concept, right. uh, but you commit to what we're calling a flags polynomial, which just is a, a zero or one times the number of operations times sorry, times the number of operation types times the number of operations. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you can create evaluation proofs with that. Somebody on chat is asking, what's the difference between the lasso approach and repeating smaller lookup tables as described in the intro? Uh, they are the same thing. No, I wish I did less animations. Um, so this this is the same idea in the intro. Um, typically in Halo 2 or something else where you do lookups and you do chunking, you end up writing the circuitry to do this yourself. The, uh, so the surge approach will do the sum checks for you. It does the collation. It sort of internalizes this collation, but it's very much the same idea of chunking. Please let me know in chat if that makes sense. So then how does this approach compare to chunking but over 
just a regular file code domain, the code execute domain versus this multi-layer version? Um, I think the way to think about chunking is just that, uh, like if we didn't chunk, we end up with those. So we, you get this uh, reduction property, the M to the one over C. If we didn't do that, so imagine we said C equals one and then M is equal to N. Or, or sorry, I meant, um, cause we can do the same strategy, but then have tables over like one, two, three, like zero, one, two, three, zero, one, three. And then the EQ is just the function that um, ties in. It's like you do EQ over the bivariate domain versus EQ over the, um, Execute. Um, I'm not sure I follow. It's like a, it's the same function, but instead it's not over the Boolean hypercube. It's just over um, the the actual split elements. Oh, you mean if we don't do it's like bit factors? Do, yeah, exactly. Like uh, like because that would be the difference, right? Because I guess the Taylor two is doing lookups over just some subgroup, and this one's doing lookups over. Like, yeah, um, it's, you need a totally different like snark backend for this. Like the so we're doing the sum check strategy, which requires that uh, like our operands are like bit vectors. Yeah, but you could do this with uh, finite fields, uh, with subgroups of finite fields, but it sounds like they would they won't have a performance of us. Yeah, I for your lineup because you can also chunk. Um, you can chunk, but then for each chunk, all the units will work harder. The, the chunking is done in practice to be like people already do chunking right like all of the lookups in in halo 2 today nobody tries to do like a 64-bit lookup it's impossible nobody also you also don't try to do like one bit lookups right and so people go to something like uh two to the four or two to the eight size tables very regularly so pe people do do this for the non-multivariate domain so what causes that difference in efficiency um So, so I don't think anybody has like directly compared the two. Um, the, the the chunking is not really the the key part. The key part is sort of like the other sum checks that happen around it um, to allow you to prove less stuff. Do you want me to? The sum check is, is the cause of the difference. Oh, it's because, uh, I mean, over uh, interpolation over such a small domain, the overhead of like, you know, sum check being linear probably is not. Such a big overhead. Uh, so actually, how big are the like normally? What what how big are the chunks? Um, in our case, yeah. Uh, you actually use the I think you aim for like two to the sixteen, two to the twenty. Yeah, so there is a big difference. Uh, like uh, per table. Yeah. Per table, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Actually, you saw the lines were pretty much together. The small and then, tables, and that's and probably then, positive. And then they separate once you get into the bigger table. So this the benefit here is actually for large exactly for the larger larger. There's there's some nuances with Halo too, actually, on that chart. Um are are you familiar with Halo 2? Oh yeah, I think I I think I, I Okay. Think I Skip it. Okay, cool. Can you can you see what goes wrong with C equals one? Uh yeah, so if C equals one, then our subtable size uh is M. And in our case, we have M is two to the 128. Um, and we have to do some compute over that. And you know, we don't have big enough computers for that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you mentioned that in this case, oh, we had only one type of subtable. Yes. Um, I assume that's not always gonna be the case. Yes. Is it also the case that the kinds of like copy constraints that exist are not gonna be a one-to-one -one mapping? Uh, what do you mean by copy constraints? I guess on the previous um, slide, you have a relationship between this large table and the subtable, where every uh, let's see, every bit that indexes into the large table represented exactly one index of the fill of the subtables. Yes, that's that's exactly right. So one, the collation function g is not always just a product. Gotcha. So like for the bitwise ones, yeah. for example, it's a weighted sum. Yeah. Um, and then two is that this indexing of how you copy over the bits is yeah. not always. So you have to do that custom per uh, per instruction. And as in for like um, addition, you're gonna like do like sub adders and you're gonna have like carry things happen. Yes, now. exactly. And the multiplication isn't gonna scale well, but you're it's gonna be fine because you're gonna like take chunks of size, I don't know, word size over four. Um, you know, we have not written multiplication yet, and so okay. I'm not certain. Sure. Interesting. Yeah, 
So in the next next slide, um, I think there was like a number. Yeah. And isn't it supposed to be two? Because I guess G is also a table, right? Multiplication. Uh, G is not a table. G is what we're, we're calling the collation function, which is the way that you combine subtables into a big table evaluation. So G is just a, a, a function uh, of four parameters, of C parameters. In this case, it's the subtable evaluations that combines all of them into a big table evaluation. In our case, it's just a product of all of those. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, and when you put this all into the all together, right? You're gonna have um like different instructions are gonna have different G collation functions and it all sort of fits together, right? Yes. That's the that's what our code deals with for you. Um uh yeah, so so the in in lasso you only have one G collation function, right? That takes uh technically alpha parameters. So if, if K is greater than one, then you have, you know, a bunch of EQ tables here and then the next table. Um, Jolt will deal with multiple collation functions and then collating the collation functions, but we're not going to talk about that. We can talk about that later if you guys are interested. Okay, cool. Um, so the two traits we talked about earlier, Jolt instruction and lasso subtable. Um, so first combine lookups. So this is just that G collation function. In our case, it was the product of all the terms. In Rust, it's that one liner there, iter dot product. Um, this G poly degree function describes the degree of the polynomial uh, T given each of the subtables is a degree one polynomial. In our case, we're taking the product all, over all of them, which makes our degree four or C. Um, subtables, um, this is all the subtables used in the decomposition. In our case, we had exactly one. It was the EQ subtable. Um, and so we have a vector of the EQ subtable. If you don't know Rust box, just forget about the box part. <clears throat> Finally, two indices. Um, this is the bit we were just discussing how these functions will have different indexing. In our case, we just need to copy the bits in pairwise. Um, so in our case, we're going to take the uh, first two bits of the first operand, the first two bits of the second operand, we're going to concatenate them, do that four times, and I'll just promise to you that that Rust code does that. Um, yeah. So this, this is what the users of Lasso would write? Yeah, so this is what you have to write per instruction, and then the code base will handle the rest for you. Um, Okay, so the materialize function, this is going to evaluate one of those subtables for all of the indices. Um, in our case, we're doing four bit subtables. Remember, m is the n to the one over c parameter. Um, and so, what we can do is we can just take for, for the EQ instruction, we can take an index that counts from zero to m. We can represent it as bits. We can split each half. And if they're equal, the corresponding row entry will be one. And if they're not equal, it'll be zero. And so that's what we do there. We split it in half. If x is equal to y, it's a one. If x is not equal to y, it's a zero. That's all we have to do. Uh, yeah, the subtable t sub t sub i or eq prime, whatever we're calling it. Um, you can also just think about this uh, as the evaluation over the m sized Boolean hypercube, all permutations of uh, length log base two of m. Wait, you have to store all that? You have to store this all in memory or what? Um, technically, you don't, we don't have to do this, but it's far from a bottleneck and it's easier. And so we do do this. And again, these tables, you said they were size 2 to the 20? 2 to the 16 to the 20. Yeah. And so they, they are stored in memory practically. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And then the evaluate MLE, which we talked about earlier, we just have to implement this function that's the multilinear extension of a B length EQ instruction. Um, in our case, that function translates to that. Um, and so this is all the work we've done combined onto one slide. That's about 30 lines for the Jolt instruction and about another 30 lines for the EQ subtable. Um, finally, if you wanted to glue all of this together, like for our one instruction Jolt VM for the 8-bit EQ instruction, uh, this, this is actually a multi-instruction VM. You would define an enum of subtables 
Um, so this one has an and and EQ subtable. You define some instructions. So we have an add and an and. Um, you define our C and our M parameters, which are going to be shared across the tables. And then all you'd have to do to prove would be to call this prove function with a vector of those operations. Um, so what I hope that we, or I, I, I showed in the last 10 minutes is that these uh, VMs are fairly simple. Um, we didn't talk about any high degree constraints, no circuits or arithmetization. We talked about a bit of indexing, um, a bit of bit manipulation and uh, some multilinear extension uh, properties. Um, and then you can have a full, full VM built on top of it. Um, you can imagine that these instructions and these subtables could be shared across a number of high level VMs. So your risk and your EVM VM could, can share the same add and multiply instructions, et cetera. Um, and that means sort of like a shared developer experience and sort of a shared audit surface across a lot of VMs. Are you, are you going to talk a little bit about how, how do you like, um, I guess this is maybe a part of scope, but like how do you implement the program counter and all this and how do you make sure the right instructions being used? Are yeah, I, I, I can talk about that if people are interested. Yeah, if, if nothing else. I'd yeah. Be the, uh... <clears throat> Unless there's other things you wanted to cover. Uh, it seems like a good direction. Ooh. Perfect, cool. Um, so this bit that we discussed, like this bit today was, yeah. How's that? Acceptable? Okay, cool. Um, okay, so there's a there's a bunch of pieces of a VM. Um, so the the piece that's really unique about La about Lasso is this lookup spit, where you can do the majority of the heavy lifting of your VMs without traditional constraints. You do them all with Lasso lookups, and so that's this middle section here. We take the transcript of lookups. That's all the operations and the opcodes, and then we ensure that those things exist within these super massive virtual lookup tables. Um, the other bits are normal VM stuff. So we have to do normal memory checking, right? Like was RAM written to and read from properly and then include the program counter. Um, and so there's an offline memory checking bit. This is actually the same code that we use for the back end of Lasso. Lasso ends up doing offline memory checking. Um, and then there's an R1CS bit um, that ensures basically the program counter gets correctly updated as well as the indexes that we decomposed earlier, if you guys remember that two indices step are correct. And so that that means like when we split uh, each lookup into alpha different chunks, um, did we decompose the high level commitments into those chunks properly? So those are dealt with through normal R1CS constraints. It's on the order of like a hundred constraints um, and handled by by Spartan, which, which is kind of fun because it's the same, uh, it's like that spark versus surge. Uh, commitment scheme.